My name is Larry Lee, and on behalf of NAFA and the NAFA National Member Benefits Committee, I'd like to welcome you to Trustworthy Selling, Recapturing the Lost Art of Selling. This time, I'd like to remind you again to please turn all cell phones and electronic devices off for the duration of this presentation. Now, it is my distinct pleasure uh, to introduce our presenter. Joy Davenport was recognized as one of the top college unit recruiters in Northwest Mutual and asked to participate in the leadership development role as a field training and development consultant. As a certified trainer and master's coach, he is considered the <coughs> executive producer of Northwest Mutual's Enduring Relationships Program and the Hoopus University and also co-produced and launched the Trustworthy Selling Program with Limer International. He is currently with the uh, Hoopus Performance Network. Please join me in giving a good, warm, grateful welcome to Joy Davenport. Joy. Hey, good morning. How you guys doing? Good. I'm going to stay down here so some of you guys in the back probably won't be able to see me <laughs> because I'm a little short. But hopefully I'll do like this every now and then so you make sure I'm still here. So... I appreciate you guys coming to this session. I know you've got options on these breakout sessions. My promise to you is I'll make this well worth it. Um, I'm going to roll through a lot of nuggets, a lot of language, a lot of things that hopefully you can take one or two things out of this talk today. And I uh, appreciate some of my friends coming in here to be a uh, support, even though they've heard me 100,000 times. So uh, with that, let me jump right in. So Trustworthy Selling is a program, like we developed it with Limra. I have a unique relationship with Limra. Um, and what it does is it recaptures the lost art of selling. And let me talk for a second about why that's important. First of all, one thing that happened in the industry is in the late 90s, uh, the industry started trending towards very left brain analytical thinking. And it was just by necessity, right? We started talking about planning analysis software and compliance and product manufacturing and things like that. And you hear people say, you know, these you know, kids today don't know how to sell. They've gotten away from the art of selling. And a lot of the veterans have even gotten away from that, more doing some product pushing and not focusing on process but products. So that's one of the things. The other reason why we had developed this was there's a crisis of trust going on in the industry. Some people call it the Bernie Madoff factor. Some call it because of the bank bailouts or because of markets. And the interesting thing is the Million Dollar Roundtable did a study just a couple of years ago, and they asked consumers across all generations, so from the silent generation all the way to millennials. And the question was, has it become significantly more difficult to trust advisors today versus five years ago? And the crazy thing was, 85% of consumers said, absolutely, it's more difficult to trust advisors today versus five years ago. The real interesting part of this study to me was, they asked advisors the same question, and only 59% of advisors, advisors said that to be the case. So there's even a blind spot among producers on this crisis of trust and the perception of consumers in the marketplace. And so part of what I want to do this morning is make you aware of that and where that comes from. The other interesting thing in the industry, and this is from Limmer Research, there's a strong need in the marketplace, stronger than ever, but there's a reluctance to buy. And why is that the case? Well, first of all, 48 million households state in a given year, this is uh, two years ago, that they don't have enough life insurance. 29 million households, almost 30 million households state that they're likely to buy life insurance in the next 12 months. These are people not with a dormant need. This is with a visible need saying, I need to buy life insurance. We're probably going to do something in the next 12 months. And guess what? Only 12% of U.S. households actually do something about it. And so the question is, with a product and a need that's so obvious that they, that they have to do something about it, they still don't pull the trigger. Why this procrastination that makes us very frustrated in the field? Well, one thing is... And what Limra did was they did uh, focus groups throughout the United States, and they had people develop collages based on their thought process around the purchase of life insurance. And if you can see this, confused and stressed and overwhelmed and sad, and so this was universal across four different uh, regions that they did this. So the other thing is consumers are afraid and they are confused. 43% um, of households report that they're afraid of making a mistake in their financial decision making. When people are afraid of making a mistake, what do they end up doing? They hunker down because they're afraid and they procrastinate and they do nothing. The other interesting one to me that always is very kind of comical to me is 71% of consumers report being more confused after they meet with you than before, if you can imagine that. <laughs> So we come in to save the day, and we got all these acronyms and all this stuff, and we leave, and they're like, uh-huh, 
uh, you know, I'm going to think about it, you know, and we're wondering what's going on and we're junking up the sales process. And so later on, I'm going to share these behavioral economics tactics that have been scientifically proven to improve the decision making process and put you on the same side of the table as your prospects and clients. But this is what we're up against. They're afraid and they're confused. All right. Now, what I want to do today, there's three areas that I want to cover. The first that I always think is important, whether you've been in the business for two minutes or if you've been in the business for 40 years, is business development and prospecting, right? And I want to talk about some tools and language that would appeal to different people in this audience, but I can guarantee you're going to pull one or two nuggets away from that that you could apply immediately next week or later this week when you get back to the field. The second is the art and science of questioning right? Not just name, rank, serial number, but how do we get, engage people in a process that gets them to lower their barriers and open up to us? And how do we engage in what I like to call these courageous conversations where we can help people align their actions, what they're doing today with their intentions, where they want to be in the future, because that's the essence of what we do. And then finally, as I mentioned, leveraging behavioral economics to improve decision making. And I'm going to give you several tactics there that you can start to apply to your closing presentations. So let's start with business development or prospect in the new normal. Three reasons for prospecting failure. It all boils down to this. One is simply don't ask, right? You miss 100% of the shots that you don't take. And so uh, what I encourage advisors to do is track the number of times you ask for referrals in the sales process. In this uncontrollable business that we're in, the only two things we control is the number of times we ask people for referrals and the number of times we physically dial the telephone to reach out to people. So if those are the two things I control, I probably would want to be tracking that. So track the number of times that you're taking shots at asking for referrals. The second is lack of belief, right? If I don't believe in what I'm doing or I add value, I'm going to send that vibe out into the universe and people are going to you know, say, well, I'm not comfortable or I can't think of anybody or whatever. And the last one, and this is where I'm going to spend all of our time this morning, is a lack of preparation. And that's the single biggest reason that people fail in this area, veterans to brand new people to intermediate people in the business. And the whole key to preparation is, Gabe likes this, being an Eagle Scout. So the uh, whole key to pre preparation is you have consistent internalized language that you use every time. I want you guys to be honest with me. How many of you all, veteran to newbies, how many of you all show of hands have consistent language used for prospecting and business development every single time? Okay, it's about 5% of the room in here. Thank you, that's good. And I appreciate you guys being honest. I talk to thousands of producers every year. It's the same. It's about 5 to 10%. Yet this is the most important part of our business, and we're winging it. Why are we winging it out there? And so I'm going to give you some language to make this very easy for you to do. Even if, worst case scenario, you plant seeds and you bow out and you move on. Second thing is having a consistent process to follow every single time. And I'm going to give you a couple of easy little tweaks that you could add to your sales process that makes it very easy to bring this conversation up. Uh, this is a Limer study, how soon consumers decide to trust someone. And it's actually 60-something percent decide to trust you in the first five minutes after meeting you. So when you come in and you've got your approach and if you're winging it, they're sizing you up. They probably got on LinkedIn ahead of time to check you out, and your profile doesn't have a picture on there. It's just that silhouette, you know what I mean? Go home and take a picture and put it up there, because I'll share with you some statistics later on about the mass affluent and their use of social media, and I'll prove that they're sizing you up before they come in and, and meet with you. But here's some language out of the gates. Okay, I meet, I'll use Gabe as an example here. I meet Gabe for the first time, John Wheeler, my buddy introduced us, right? And I start the conversation off and we've got the meaningful small talk. I'm talking about the cute little kids and the fish on the wall. And I'm trying to transition into my approach language to get into a fact finder. And all I say is I say, hey, Gabe, first of all, I'd like to thank John Wheeler for introducing us. That's important because I work exclusively on a personal introduction basis. Now let me take a minute, share with you the type of work I do, the process, whatever your approach is, right? So all I do is I go, hey, well, first of all, Gabe, let me thank John Wheeler for introducing us. That's important because I work exclusively on a personal introduction basis. There's about four or five benefits with me opening up with these two lines. What's one benefit, you think? Okay, I'm, I'm planting a seed, right? The reason you plant a seed is so I can harvest a seed later on. The reason we don't bring up prospecting because I get to the end of the fact finder and it comes out of nowhere, right? And it feels very awkward. And so then I get out of there because I opened a case and I don't want to ruin it at that point. And then I never ask, but I'm planting a seed. What's another benefit? Okay. What's the only thing we have in common at this point? John Wheeler. That's it. So five minutes before the conversation, they're going, I'm too busy. 
Why do I agree to this? What's he going to sell me? So this relationship tension's through the roof. We're going, am I in over my head? Are they going to show up? You know, so you've got this tension like this. And I show up and say, first of all, I'd like to thank John Wheeler, someone that we have in common, and I don't get into consistency theory and things like that, but all of a sudden relationship tension reduces and trust increases out of the gates. What's another thing? How do I work here? What's the power phrase? Okay. All right, I'll go there. They've done studies that the word referral has negative connotations in the marketplace. So I work on a personal introduction basis or a friend to a friend basis, right? What's my power phrase here? How do I work? I work exclusively like a doctor, like an attorney. I work exclusively on a personal introduction basis. So with this, this is how you could start out your meeting, no matter how long you've been in the business, assuming you're referred, that's the key, right? You have to have a referral coming in. But there's four or five benefits of just opening the meeting up with these two languages to do all that stuff we just mentioned. And there's a few others, but I, you know, I won't get into that right now. I got this from Bill Cates. I like to repurpose stuff, so I'll give you credit where credit's due. Some of you guys have seen this. Um, let's say you say, I'm not going to ask for referrals. I'm not comfortable with whatever. 100% of the time, you can plant referral seeds. And the way you do this is, when I start to leave, and I'm leaving Mike, I'd say, hey, Mike, keep in mind, I work exclusively on a personal introduction basis, like I told you earlier. I'm never too busy to see if I can help friends or family members that you care a lot about. And so I say it, I move on, I planted the seed. I didn't ask for a referral. Don't make a mistake here. This isn't asking. This is kind of, when you get to Wimp Junction, <laughs> there's like two roads you can take. This is taking the road more traveled down, but at least I'm planting a seed there in your mind right before I leave. Um, Here's the other thing. The reason people don't ask for referrals, let's say I have a great fact-finding appointment or let's say I write some business and stuff and it's time to go into prospecting. A lot of producers will avoid this because they don't want to end the meeting on a negative basis, right? If I don't get referrals, ah, I ended it on a down note. Well, what you do here is you'd say, let's say I try to ask for referrals, I'm getting a little resistance and eventually what I do is I'll say, uh, Lou, you know what? Um, if you happen to run, I'll tell you what, no, that's fair, you didn't want to give me referrals. If you happen to run across somebody in the future that you think could benefit from meeting me, would you have any objection mentioning my name to them? What do they say 100% of the time, 99%? Oh yeah, you got some cards, I'll pass them out, you know, all this. And what do I do? I bowed out gracefully, I ended the meeting on a positive note, there's no downside risk to planting a seed or saying this. So all I'm trying to do is provide you with a little bit of language to set the stage and some language at the end to be able to get out of this gracefully so that you don't end anything on a down note. You guys good? Okay, good. Here's the other kicker I've said for years. People know people, not referrals. If you're in the business development and prospecting process and someone says, I can't think of anybody, nobody comes to mind, you have failed to feed specific names and categories, all right? But if I say, Jeff, earlier you mentioned that your sister's the guardian of your children. Tell me more about her. Is, is she married? Does she have children? Where does she work? I've already identified someone in his life that came up in the conversation. There's no... I can't think of anybody, nobody comes to mind. Or I might say, earlier you mentioned you belong to Greenwood Country Club. Who are two of your best buddies that are typically playing in the golf foursome with you? So I'm identifying specific names and categories. Why? People know people, not referrals. And so this is kind of basic one-on-one -on -one stuff, but hopefully you guys are doing this. You have to have specific categories that you're feeding to people. Who do you know that owns the most real estate? Um, who do you know that uh, is approaching retirement who might need some advice or help with their 401k rollover? Because 67% of people within two months of retirement have no clue what they're going to do with their 401k. Um, I always used to say, who's the person that's all set, super wealthy, that there's no possible way I could help them? And whoever comes off their lips next is the greatest prospect I could have gotten, right? So the key is you've got to have these in your toolbox where you're feeding specific names and categories. But let's take this up a step. I work with top of the table producers that I uh, get to do this all the time. Develop your ideal client profile. What it is, it's a one pager that lists the markets and the types of people that you can help the most, right? A lot of this would be your top clients and things. And what I'd simply say is, um, I'd say, hey, Mary, what I've done is I've identified the people that can, I can help the most based on my experience. And I'd love to brainstorm with you for a minute to see if you know people uh, on this list that might work in these types of industries or these companies that are here in the local area. Um, who do you know that owns a franchise, a f closely held family-owned business, a consultant, etc.? Show of hands in here. How many of you all know somebody that owns a franchise? Show of hands if you do. Okay, about a third of you. Every audience I go to, it's about a third that knows it. And so all I do is, who raised their hand? Give me an example. Okay, Bill, who do you know owns a franchise? Um, I he owns, uh, six, McDonald's. six McDonald's? And how do you know him? 
refer to him? Okay. And then what I do is all of a sudden I'm into a conversation about this fellow that owns six McDonald's and I start qualifying and I go, that sounds like exactly the type of person I work with. I work with a lot of business owners that are too busy in their life running their business, don't have time to think about this stuff. Would you have any objection in the future of mentioning my name or if I give him a call and mention we've done some work together, but I've pinpointed who he knows. So what happens is if you present this list, one, you're showing the importance of the prospecting process. You've taken the time to put this together. So it elevates your professionalism. Two, it gets them brains thinking through. If they don't know people on the list, a lot of times they might be trying to think of somebody on the list just because they don't know anybody that fits these categories. And there's a lot of different things you can do with this. I've got medical professionals. I've got local companies. Who do you know that works in Motorola, Coca-Cola, et cetera? Because remember, people know people, not referrals. And the beauty of the ideal client profile is I can laminate it and I don't have to reinvent it every week or every month. I carry it around with me for a few months and you can tweak it over time, but it works because of the concept of people know people, not referrals. Sure. I think they probably provide the slides. Do they have them on a CD or the website or so? I've given to them to give away, so I don't keep them locked down or anything, but we'll find out. Yeah. You're free to have them, so I, however I'd put them on the website or so, absolutely. Um, social media marketing. Now, here's what's funny. Some people immediately, the veterans in here are going, ah, yeah, I'm going to tune them, check my Blackberry for a minute or whatever, and because they're like, ah, social media marketing is too complicated. It's not. We were just in the last session talking about the Life Foundation's resources um, that you can post out there that you subscribe to and it automatically posts it on your LinkedIn or Facebook. I don't do anything. I've got two posts coming out a week from the Life Foundation with links to the website and all I did was subscribe by clicking a button. So this stuff's easier than you think, but for the veterans, you should pay attention to this because it's very turnkey and you guys have staff, so your staff can do most of this stuff. And for you guys that are 40 and under or so, definitely pay attention. I'm going to give you some nuggets on leveraging. Now, how many of you show of hands are on LinkedIn? Okay, hopefully almost everybody in here. What was funny was there was an article in Fortune, actually not an article, it was on the cover of Fortune last month. And what it said was LinkedIn is going to revolutionize how we do business in the world over the next decade. Because Facebook and Twitter kind of scoffed and laughed at LinkedIn because they thought it was just a repository for resumes. It's gone way past that. And I think it's the single greatest tool that's been invented for a financial advisor since I've been in the business for 20 years. And so if you're not on there, I encourage you to do so. But what I wanted to do is I wanted to share with you a white paper that came out a few months ago. And everybody, for the most part, maybe not everybody's here trying to get mass affluent, but you know, to those, the, the, better, the, the bigger the better, right? It works out. But they did a study around influencing the mass affluent and their use of social media. And here's what's interesting. The mass affluent adoption of social media is about 87% as compared to about 54% outside of mass affluent. Most likely to turn to LinkedIn for professional purposes. Two out of five use social media for consideration of financial companies and products. They're in there looking at your profile if you're coming out to meet them and they're savvy. The mass affluent considered improved customer service, timely updates, relevant content to be the most valuable. So here's a few other. 44% of mass affluent social media users engage with financial companies. This is about half, which is interesting. They follow companies. 31% read content from financial companies on social media. 30% follow or like financial companies on social media. I just think that's kind of interesting. I'm a, I'm a millionaire and I go and I like the company, you know, in there, but it's what's happening. And 23% review multimedia content from financial companies on social media. So here's just an example. Your company might have these. If they don't, you can easily have your staff kind of fabricate, just kind of write up a few of these and get them approved. But I went in on my LinkedIn account in the last week and the advisors I'm connected to, which are you know, thousands at this point, these are just examples of stuff they had on social media posts. One out of six retirees has a written plan. How do you feel about your current plan? Click here to view a sample financial plan. And perhaps it'd be right on your website. Anthony Morris talks about this, having a sample financial plan on your website to drive traffic there. How formal does a state plan have, need to be? Click here to find out. Uh, check out the top financial concerns of business owners from our annual survey. Uh, click here to learn about the top five living benefits of life insurance. For those of you all that are with a company, I'm giving probably more than a 50% chance they've created prefabricated posts. They do that because they don't want you out there posting your own stuff <laughs> for compliance purposes, okay? And all you do is you have your assistant post this stuff out there, okay, regularly, or you could develop your own and get them approved. And it's relatively easy to do if you're on LinkedIn and just post your status update, but I'm going to make it even easier uh, before I transition out of this. One thing that I subscribe to is a website called Hootsuite, all right? Hootsuite is a, a website service. It's five bucks a month, and here's how it works. 
Everybody thinks I'm like savvy on social media or somewhat savvy, I guess, because I'm relatively active. They don't leave us in this room. Don't let this secret out, okay? I'm going to give you guys the keys to the castle on here. So what happens is I take about three hours in December, and I'll come up with 365 posts, all right, one for each day of the year. Well, about half those, two a week are quotes. One of them is discovery question of the week. Uh, a couple of them are factoids about the business, right, nuggets on things I've developed like trust reselling or things like that. My assistant goes in into Hootsuite and sets those up to go out at noon every single day for a year. I don't touch it for 12 months. So every day at noon, there's something coming out from Joey Davenport that I came up with in December, and it's turnkey and it's on autopilot. Now, 365 is a lot, right? But if you did 52, if you did one every other week or something like that, it's pretty easy to do this. And I'll talk with like heads of distribution. This happened four times to me this year, and I love this talking to a guy that runs three distribution systems in Canada. We're in Chicago meeting in our office. And he says, Joey, he goes, I have to tell you, he goes, I see your postings on LinkedIn. He goes, and every time I see them, I think about HPN. It, it does create top of mind awareness. And I've had like three or four executives this year that have made comment about that. Now, I'm not thinking these guys are looking at this stuff, but they're traveling all the time. So they're looking at LinkedIn and who's posting what. And this is a great way in the old days where we had to stay in touch with clients on a regular basis every six months, it's a great passive way to keep in touch with prospects or clients you've opened cases up with because they're constantly seeing something kind of coming out from you, right? Top of mind awareness. So I know some of you guys reject this. I'm telling you, embrace it because we don't dictate this. Consumers dictate it and it's not coming. It's here and you might as well leverage it because it's one of the greatest tools that's been invented since I've been in the business. Okay, you guys good with prospecting stuff? time okay good let's get rolling then let's get into the art of questioning so now I've got referral I come in I go through my approach after doing my two sentences up front with business development I am into the fact finder or what I like to call the collaborative discovery because fact finder is really like name rank serial number and too many people out there are focused on the fact facts right they're focused on product but I say the process is the product that's the unique value proposition that we bring to the table is the process that we take people through to identify where their actions are misaligned with their intentions okay so i want to give you a few nuggets on this and just my experience with it and some things that will hopefully help you uh, have more confidence in engaging people in tough conversations okay i like to use the metaphor of the iceberg all right and um, what's interesting with an iceberg if you look at it all we see is the tip of the iceberg above the, the surface, right? Four-fifths of the mass of the iceberg is submerged underneath the water. How many of you guys saw the movie Titanic? Probably most everybody in here. Remember when they're rolling towards the iceberg, and the guy's like, oh, iceberg, and they steer around it, and it looks like they missed it, and they thought they missed it, and it still tore out the hull of the ship? Why? Four-fifths of the mass of the iceberg is under the water. We can't see it. And so what I always equate this to, from a metaphor standpoint, is this tip of the iceberg is most financial professionals approach to fact finding. It's definitely, and I can say this until we start to bring more of our uh, banking brethren in here, which we should be doing, but it's definitely like the banker, right? For 150 years, I mean, my wife's a, a uh, commercial lender, or she used to be, and they've come from the old retail transaction standpoint, right? So they're asking the fact facts, right? How much do you have in your account? Blah, 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 blah. It's all the surface stuff. This is what the stockbroker's doing, and this is what a lot of financial professionals, insurance professionals, are doing out there. But the fact of the matter is, our clients have goals, fears, dreams that are beneath the surface. And to the extent that we can dig deeper and that we can ask the tougher questions to uncover that stuff, we're more likely to not only make a connection with them, but also to help align those actions with intentions. Let's talk for a minute about the dynamics of courageous conversations, all right? I think if we understand this, begin with the end in mind, uh, you're more of a uh, become an unconscious competent, meaning you just naturally kind of know what to do and get past it uh, because you understand some of the psychology behind this. Why do advisors avoid engaging in these difficult conversations? When we know somebody's not doing something they're supposed to do and we need to challenge them or whatever, why do we avoid this? What do you guys think? Don't know how? Okay, what else? We're uncomfortable, right? Fear of making them mad, right? Fear of rejection, you know? Well, fact of the matter is, many of us are walking through the sales process. We don't have a lot of activity. So it's like this fragile China egg that we're just like, oh, I don't want to say ask for referrals because it might break down the process. And oh, yeah, yeah. hat in hand, right? 
But you talk to people that are keeping 50, 60 appointments a month, they're playing with house money, man. They're not worried about, you know, offending people or whatever. And so a big reason is we're afraid of ticking people off or whatever it might be. And the fact of the matter is, most people walk around in their life, even with our families, it's very high level, superficial conversation. I love when I'm at these conferences, I get on the elevator, it's a nice day out there today. <laughs> you know, the one universal thing we all have in common, the weather. Uh, look, gonna look good out there, it's sunny. When I hear it, I just, I chuckle, right? It's funny, it's our one universal thing. But some people might go a step further than that or whatever, but the conversations we have to have, most people have never engaged in these type of conversations. And so we're scared of it and uncomfortable because of those reasons. How about this? Why do prospects and clients avoid these difficult conversations? What do you think? They don't want to hear the answer. Well, denial is a great coping mechanism, right? Out of sight, out of mind. So if I have this conversation, I might actually have to go do something about it. Um, what else? Why do you think they avoid it? Afraid they might have to do some work or it might put stuff in their plate. The other thing is, if I have this conversation, you might start encroaching on my boat money or my Saturday night money. Even though I've got the Beamer in the driveway and the big house, if you start looking, here's the other one, they're embarrassed. Because if you start looking under the hood, even though I've got the Beamer and all this, I mean, we know every, most people in the United States are living beyond their means, right? I mean, this is why I tell young people who get frustrated in the first six months of the business when they're chasing Uncle Charlie and Aunt Jane who won't call them back, it's because... A yes is great, a no is fine, but a maybe is going to kill you. And Uncle John doesn't want to have to tell you no because they're embarrassed about their situation, so they're ducking and dodging. You see him in the grocery store? <laughs> he gets in his Beamer and drives off. He's got 10-year level term, $20,000 10-year level term. <laughs> but that's the fact of the matter, right? But if we understand this, then we can empathize and begin with the end in mind, and I think it gives us courage, right? Become, become an unconscious competent. But here's the kicker. What are the benefits? And just for time's sake, I'll go through this. We know the, the risk and the downside, but here's the benefits. First of all, it's going to differentiate you in the marketplace. Do you think prospects and clients know when you're digging deep and asking the tough questions? You betcha because you're like the eighth advisor they've met with who's done name, rank, serial number, and now all of a sudden you come in and say, what did you learn from your parents about saving and investing? And shut up, and they're going, sheesh, you know? And they're having to think about things they haven't thought about, so you differentiate yourself. The other is, you do what we're looking to do is align people's actions with their intentions, and we know from the studies, people aren't saving enough money, they don't have enough life insurance. That's why this is the golden age of financial services, but as we saw from the numbers, left to their own devices, they don't do anything about it. They do something about it two different times. One, when someone like us proactively becomes the catalyst, and then the other time is when it's too late is when they're thinking about this stuff. And so the benefit is aligning actions with intentions. And lastly, the benefit is you actually develop a deep relationship and make yourself more attractive. And uh, I'll get into this just for a second. It's called the psychology of attraction. You guys might know Sigmund Freud, the Austrian psychotherapist, right? And the funny thing about psychotherapists, everybody used to knock them because they don't have solutions. They just ask you all the questions and try to draw it out. So Freud, you'd come in, he'd lay his clients down on the couch. Tell me about a time in your life when this happened, Alan. How did that make you feel? Tell me more about that. What impact did that have on this? And so you're kind of solving your own problems by just talking through it, right? Well, it's very similar to what a top producer would do in our discovery process. They're not providing all the answers. They're asking questions and facilitating the process. Well, here's what's interesting. Because Freud had so many famous clients, years after his death, they collected memoirs and diaries and notes of his famous clients. And about a third of Freud's clients had fallen in love with him, unbeknownst to him. They had become infatuated with Freud. Why is that? Here's why. Because the deepest principle in human nature is the craving to be understood and appreciated. That's William James, the father of American psychology, said in the 1800s. The deepest principle in human nature is this deep psychological need to be understood and appreciated, yet in this high-tech, highly impersonal world, no one takes the time to understand and appreciate another human being. And yet, that's our role, to go into our communities and engage people on this level. It not only does all the things we we're talking about, but the psychology of attraction, it makes you more attractive because the psychology of attraction, here's why. If Alan leaves my office and I go, I just told Alan more than I've told my spouse, my attorney, my best friend. I wouldn't say, he's a complete numbskull, right? 
I would do everything I could to justify why the heck I just shared stuff with him. So I'm going to say, this guy's a good advisor. I like him, you know. That's why they do studies on life insurance. They go, what do you think about a life insurance salesperson? It like falls down to the low list of the advisor, you know, of the professions. And then they ask people about their life insurance advisor. They go, oh, my life insurance advisor is the best. You seen these? I mean, they fall the low list of a profession. And, but you ask somebody about their advisor or life insurance professional, and it's the most trusted confidant in their life, right, because of this work that we do, which is pretty amazing. So here's the question. How do you start to do this? All righty. I came up with this model. I don't have time to get into this in depth, but hopefully this will help you to start to tactically do this. It's called the RPM questioning model. I always say we're fast is slow and slow is fast. And so the first is R questions, reality questions. You guys are all good at that. Name, rank, serial number, right? It's the fact facts. But the second is pain gain questions. And what pain gain questions are is when you help people identify where actions are misaligned with intentions. It's asking them about when they'd like to be in a position to retire, how much they think that would take, and then where are they currently doing about it, and we can immediately realize where gaps are in their planning. But here's the kicker. We know people aren't saving enough money. They don't have enough life insurance. If you all went out and took five fact finders next week, I can guarantee you're probably going to open cases in four out of five, maybe five out of five, because of the fact people aren't saving enough money and they don't own enough life insurance. So, but then when we call them back, we either can't get in touch with them or they want to think about it or whatever, and we're so frustrated. And I think what happens is things like life insurance aren't going to happen to me or retirement's so far off, you know, that I, I can kind of put it out of sight, out of mind. And so the key is top producers from the work that I've done with them, they take this conversation a step further and they ask what's called a magnification question. So identify the gap. You need $500,000 more life insurance, right? It's not enough just to do that. They can put that off. What I have to do is ask questions that magnify the potential implications of that gap of life insurance. And it's not for me telling you what you should or ought to do. That was the old days, right? You should do this. You should think about this. You guys might know the godfather of the business, Al Granham. He used to call it backing the hearse up to the door <laughs> in the 60s. You got to back the hearse up to the door, you know. We've come a long way, you know, from that. But it's not us telling people what they should do. It's me facilitating the conversation, and it's asking one or two questions more that talk about the implications of the gap of life insurance. That's what differentiates the top-of-the-table producers. So if you think about the reality pain gain and magnification questions relative to the metaphor of the iceberg. This is the way that would look. And I always use this prose from Benjamin Franklin that I think kind of illustrates this in a great way. So Benjamin Franklin is trying to sell the king on why the king should purchase a very commoditized item, a little horseshoe nail, you know, that they nail into the horse's hoof. And so he says, hey, it might look just like a nail to you, sire, but what would happen if for one of the nail, the horseshoe was lost, for one of a shoe, the horse was lost, for one of the horse, the rider was lost. For one of the rider, the battle was lost. And for one of a battle, the kingdom was lost. And why? All for the want of a horseshoe nail. You see what's happening in here? So I'm coming in with a commoditized thing, but my deal is if I talk about the ramifications of the lack of having this in the bigger picture, then all of a sudden it doesn't become a commodity. It becomes a pretty important piece to win in the battle. And that's what happens. We're going to talk about the gap. You need more of this. You need more of that. We need to talk about the implications of that and take the conversation a step further. And this is a magnification question. They ask about the consequences, effects, or implications of the prospect situation. Um, they uh, develop the clarity and strength of the problem. And here's the big one. is expands the prospect's perception of value. And so the way I – actually, I'll give you a couple examples here. For retirement. Uh, what will you do if you get to retirement and you haven't achieved your objectives? Are you going to work longer or are you going to retire on less money, right? We talk about they have a retirement gap. The implication is, hey, if you get to retirement, what are you going to do? You're going to work longer, retire on less. Boom, I shut up. This is when they start to wiggle because I'm having a, an adult conversation with these people around this stuff, right? Um, what happens if the need for long-term care uh, for your spouse impacts your nest egg in retirement? That's a little bit different conversation. I'm talking about implications and laying out the realities. And I'm, I'm not saying you need to do this or you should do that. I'm just asking what happens if this happens? How, what's your plan or contingency for this? Here's some for life insurance. How would your family maintain the standard of living, uh, standard of living if something were to happen to you? Uh, sometimes your spouse, who would stay home to raise the children? My wife, Lindy, I'm blessed enough to where she can stay home, a little four-year-old will. She is the CEO of the household, man. I mean, she runs the show from top to bottom. Yeah, I didn't realize there was that much stuff going on. There's a lot. 
And luckily, I have a lot of life insurance on her because if God forbid something happens to her, my world would be upside down. And yet you have all these men or women there with working uh, spouses that work at home and they say, oh, it's fine. You know, we'll do this. I can support. It's not the reality. And so we have to have adult conversations with these people. And I use this visual just as the last piece before I move on is we're always talking about you need more life insurance and they've got the premium over here. And what happens is in their mind, the perception of value is the premium is the problem. The premium is the problem. But if I start talking about, you know, what happens to the home? You know, do you have to sell your home? How are you going to pay the mortgage? Or you you know, what do you do? You're paying for private school now. Will the kids go to public school? What's kind of your contingency plan for there? Um, what about college planning? Would your kids take out student loans? Where would they find that money? And all of a sudden, the premium's not the problem. The premium is the solution to the problem because I've had an adult conversation to ask questions about the implications because it's very easy for people to gloss over this stuff. And this is why we are life insurance professionals. We roll the sleeves up and we have these kind of conversations that other people do not have, okay? Okay, with that, so that's fact-finding, right? and asking questions to identify the need. Now let's get into the final piece of this, which is going back to make your presentation. And one thing I've done is partner with LIMRA. And what's funny is um, LIMRA has all this great research. They've been around for 80 years. How many of you guys know LIMRA? Show of hands, you guys know LIMRA. Okay, most people do in here. What happens is the LIMRA content gets caught up in the home office because the home office is by access to it. And most people in the field, the LIMRA stuff never sees the light of day. Well, I'm lucky because I get to go into the coffers <laughs> and looking around at this research and I'll find not the 50 page studies. I find the five page executive summaries that you guys like, right? Like me, short and sweet. And I find stuff that's field friendly and publish it and post to the field because it's a tragedy that a lot of this stuff never gets down to us. And it's how the consumer is thinking and why they're not buying, et cetera. So what I'd like to share with you is behavioral economics tactics, seven of them, and I won't be able to go through all of them that have been identified to increase the, 20, uh, increase the likelihood of somebody buying by 29%, okay? They're very simple. I'm gonna give you some easy ones today. We could spend like a full day, but I'm gonna give you some easy ones today so you can walk away with some nuggets that you could start to use later on this week. And uh, the premise of this is people choose poorly when making financial decisions. And so the immediate context and the way we're positioning our solutions makes all the difference in the world on if they're confused or not, or if they're able to process it in a way to wanna move forward. And so we can improve people's decisions by controlling features and little things that we say. What you say and how you say it makes all the difference in success or failure as you get into that closing presentation, okay? And the interesting thing was, just to give you the science behind this, Limmer did focus groups in four different cities and they would go in and have a, an advisor come in and do a presentation using traditional methods and then they would have them doing a presentation using behavioral economics incorporated through there. And you guys know like in the, now in the political landscape, they have the little lunch thing where they dial it up or dial it down. So they're sitting behind a glass wall. You say something I like, I cut it up. You say something I don't like, I tank you down, right? And so it's real time feedback of what's resonating and not with the consumer. So as you can see on this, my little red line's not that great. The traditional method, kind of even up front, but all of a sudden, man, this thing, and by the end, it's come off the rails. Whereas if you just change what you say and how you say it a little bit, all of a sudden, it's the difference in a 30% increase in likelihood to move forward. So let's go into some of these uh, this morning. First of all, avoid ambiguity, all right? We talk about acronyms and we've got all this ambiguous stuff because you know, we, were, we were taught that uh, vagueness means profoundness, right? Or the more you talked over somebody, the smarter you looked. And we've carried that with us in this process, right? And it couldn't tick off and annoy consumers more. The other thing is visualization. We're dealing with intangible products. They're taking our word for it that the life insurance is going to come to fruition or the retirement plan is going to complete itself. To the extent we can tie back visually to what we're recommending, the more likely they're able to do something because we let them test drive it from an emotional standpoint. Personal experiences overcome optimism. I'm going to go in each one of these. The doctrine of fairness. People want to feel like they're being treated fairly. If they don't feel like they're being treated fairly, I will actually make decisions counter to my best interest just to spite the advisor, if you can imagine that. It's kind of interesting. Um, heuristics, which are rules of thumb, and then last, oh, mental accounts, and then lastly, present value. So I'm gonna go through each one of these. Uh, actually, I'm not gonna go through all of these. Avoid ambiguity um, and visualization. I'll pass through those just for the sake of today, but I will get into this. Personal experiences overcome optimism. People are naturally optimistic in life that things aren't going to happen to them. I'll give you an example. 
when you go to rent a car and you know you have the option to tack on the uh, car insurance or whatever, what percentage of the United States do you think actually checks the box to take the insurance? What percentage? Okay, it's good, good, 16%. Why? Everybody thinks they're a good driver, you know? And everybody thinks they're a good driver, and, but it's the contrary to the truth. I'll tell a quick story. My business partner, Harry Hoopus, right? He's, he's, got a, he's got this Bentley. And he's a good driver. You ride with him. He's one of those that goes, whoa, whoa. <laughs> yeah. He's got this great car, right? I'm riding shotgun. I'm like about to throw up, you know? And you talk to him. Don't anybody tell him this. You guys in Chicago. I'm like, here's this guy, the nicest car money can buy, right? And, whoa, whoa. and you ask him, he's like, oh, yeah, I'm a pretty good driver. Oh, yeah, you know, it's just, anyway. I digress. You Chicago guys, don't we say anything? <laughs> I don't know why I went there, but I just did. Sometimes that happens in these talks. You just feel like sharing. Yeah, yeah. Is this mic on recording? Um, here's another one for you. Marriage. You ask somebody a week before they get married, what do you think, Lou, the uh, likelihood of this is workout's going to be? <laughs> what do people say? Well, my, my marriage, I'm, you know, I'm definitely going to work out. We know in this country, right, 50% of marriages don't work out, but people are overly optimistic. Here's where this comes from. If they're overly optimistic, then we have to share stories about term conversions and kitty policies. And if you don't have stories, which this is what's great about NAFA, we can borrow stories, right? But you have to have these tucked away because, as Joe Jordan says, you can't move people forward with left-brain analytical thinking. You have to tie back to these stories. I'll give you a quick example, and Gabe, my buddy's in here. Gabe Smith, my fraternity brother, uh, went to Middle Tennessee State University. Uh, we have a great friend. His name's Scott Collier. Gabe sold him a million dollars of term life insurance. He's walking out to the driveway one day. He's 30 years old. Car comes over the hill, veers off the road, hits him, knocks him 40 feet into a fence. He was in intensive care to Vanderbilt for four or five days. It was a bad deal. He came out of it, though. But he's had these issues for 10 years now. And for a while, he was blacking out. And they diagnosed it with narcolepsy. You know, you'd have like moments of blackouts. And then it was something else and something else. Well, what ends up happening is he found, he didn't find this out like seven years later. It had messed up his pituitary gland. And your pituitary gland handles everything, okay? He now has about 17 different doctors. And he has on 17 or 18 different medications. His full-time job is going to doctors. And so... But he walks around and he talks and all this, but he was permanently disabled. Well, Gabe had waiver premium on that policy with our old company, Northwestern Mutual. You know what they did? They converted the million dollars of term to permanent. They pay that premium every single month, about 1200 bucks a month. And when our buddy Scott Collier is age 65, he's going to have $2.3 million of cash value in that thing. And he's coming to Gabe saying, where's my dignity? You know, my wife works now. What am I going to do for my kids? How's my legacy? Guess what, buddy? There's your legacy. And that's a much better way to sell waiver premium than me to go, well, with this waiver of premium, what happens if you become sick or hurt along the way and inconstituted and blah, blah, blah. I don't even know what the definition is anymore, right? But, and they're going, no, I'll pass on that. $5 a month, nah, I'm good, <laughs> you know? No, you're not good. If you're not putting waiver premium on every policy you sell, shame on you, right, on it, because it's too inexpensive to do it. So, but guess what? That's my 30-second, one-minute story on waiver of premium if I need to tell it, right? I've got one for kitty policy. I need one for term conversions. Why? Because personal experiences overcome optimism in a naturally optimistic world where it ain't going to happen to me. Here's the fairness principle. People want to be treated fairly in the sales process. If I feel like you're not treating me fairly, I will make decisions counter my best interest just to spite Richard if I think he's not treating me fairly. It's very interesting, right? So there's a lot of things we could talk about on this. I'm going to give you some nuggets you could even use later this week. Here's what you do. You're going through a ledger presentation. You pause intermittently, and you ask, hey, I know this stuff can be pretty confusing. At this point, what questions do you have? And I just pause. What's the difference in me saying what questions do you have versus, hey, uh, do you have any questions? What's the difference there? Do you have any questions at this point? Or, hey, what questions do you have? I'm assuming they have questions. I know this stuff's confusing. Here's what happens. We roll through a ledger that we didn't even understand for three or four years, right? We expect them to understand it on the spot. Do you have any questions? Uh-uh. <laughs> and everybody's like, they won't call me back. I don't know why they won't call me back. And I'm like, because they're freaking confused in the corner, like biting their tongue off, going, ah. You know, they're putting a collage together, going, I'm freaked out. But, but what questions do you have? And here's another one. You're rolling through the presentation, you pause intermittently, and you say, hey, let me just pause for a minute. I know this can be confusing. Am I explaining this clearly? Versus, does this make sense to you? What's the difference there? 
condescending. I'm putting it on me, Bill. Hey, man, does this, am I explaining this clearly? You know, what questions do you have? These little things, what you say makes all the difference in the world in success or failure because of behavioral economics and the way people process information. Here's the last one I always think is interesting in this hour talk is um, they did find from the research that people want options. They, they don't want you to come guns blazing and go, you need to do this. They want options, but they want the advisor to make a specific recommendation and to explain why they're making the recommendation. I think that's why for years we've said, here it is in all term, here it is in all permanent. Most of my clients do a combination of the two. It really boils down to a cash flow issue. That's what I would recommend we do because of that reason. And I think that's why that's worked. So they want options. They feel like they're being treated fairly, but make a specific recommendation and explain why you're doing that. Heuristics, rules of thumb. People want rules of thumb, all right? When I went on my first estate cases early on in the business, I was like 22, and going with a big prospect, bringing the estate planning specials, I'm thinking, he, Chuck Boyd, I'm thinking he's going to, pew, 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 you know, all this complicated stuff, and he starts drawing like a tree, and then like a dog, and all this stuff, and I'm like, this guy's worth $20 million, what are you doing, you know, he's looking for sophistication, and they're not, wealth doesn't mean people want complication, right, it, it, they don't want it at all, they want it simplified, and so heuristics, or rules of thumb, are what people want, here's why, when I'm making a decision on something that's an intangible, that the benefits might be 15, 20 years off into them, I can't, when I can't make a decision, you know, based on what I think it's going to do, I make a decision based on what similar people in my similar circumstances have done. That's why eight to ten times income in life insurance, three to six uh, times uh, income in your emergency fund, right? These kind of things are rules of thumb. You can go online and look up these. I mean, there's about a ten common rules of thumb that people want, and it resonates with people, so don't get away from that. By the way, as a side note, we always talk about eight to ten times income in life insurance. Do you remember what the Red Cross was paying out after 9-11? It's 20 times or 17 to 20 times, yeah. So we talk about human life value that we've gotten away from, right? Well, we're, you know, chintzing around around what somebody's life's worth. You know, go tell somebody 17 to 20 times. Here's one, and uh, i got a couple more. I'm right on time, so I like that. All right, mental accounts. People have mental accounts for their money. I've got a mental account for my boat money, my Saturday night money, my 401K, my kids' college planning. i got these pockets of money. We're not competing against other advisors or whatever. We're competing against where somebody's going to spend a dollar. Are they going to spend it on financial security? Or are they going to spend it on immediate gratification? And so what behavioral economics found is to the extent that what we're recommending can tap into multiple buckets, they're more likely to justify spending the dollar. So for you old schoolers in here, that's why in the 70s, the old live, die, quit, become disabled worked really well, right? Because I'm making a recommendation on permanent life insurance. It's my buddy John Wheeler. If you don't download this talk that he gave yesterday on whole life insurance as an uh, as a asset class, uh, as an asset, is one of the best talks I've seen here. But um, if you're talking about permanent life insurance, and I say, look, here's the kicker. If you die too soon, we've got your family covered. If you live too long, we can annuitize this or pull a stream of income to help you in your longevity. If you become sick or hurt along the way, this can be self-completing. And lastly, if you want to stop paying in 15 years, you can do it. And so that's why live, die, quit, become disabled became so popular back in the day. And Mike Smith this morning was talking about living benefits of life insurance, life insurance policies now that have a critical illness rider on it. Or let's say the long-term care policy that, or the annuity that uh, converts into long-term care, these combo products, that's why they're popular in the marketplace because of this mental account. If I can spend a dollar and feel like I'm killing several birds with one stone, I'm more likely to justify it. So if you've gotten away from live, die, quit, become disabled on permanent life insurance, get back to it. Now in the 70s, you guys didn't say, this is behavioral economics, you know? We just intuitively worked because we're always have been wired around this way, all right? And here's my last one. Present value. Current income flow is more important in budgeting decisions than the present value of lifetime wealth. That's a mouthful. What this means is, we, and Joe Jordan harps on this and goes crazy and says that the annuity companies have got this wrong. The annuity companies talk about the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. This is going to annuitize, you're going to have $2.1 million at the end in retirement. People don't think like that. They think in terms of monthly income. So what you have to do is break it down by saying, this annuity is going to provide you with $10,000 a month for the rest of your life, right? This life insurance, it's not going to pay you $1.2 million in death benefit. You have to talk about it in the terms of monthly income because that's what resonates with people. But the annuity companies, look at all the literature. They really have gotten this wrong. I'm hoping they're going to change this out. But a couple of nuggets in the end. If you meet a prospect six months ago, they didn't know you were going to show up at their doorstep. 
So as you're making recommendations about life insurance or annuities or whatever, in the back of their mind, they're thinking, shoot, I didn't budget for this, I can't afford this or whatever. And what they found from the research is if you'll simply say, hey, Alan, I know we didn't budget for this, but if we can find the money this year, I'm confident we can budget for us next year. Fair enough? And so simply by just acknowledging that is I know that we didn't, I know if we didn't budget for this, but if we can find the money this year, we can budget for it next year. Fair enough? And people were much more likely to move forward because they're thinking it anyway, but they feel like you're empathizing and putting yourself on the same side of the table with them. So the end is near. <laughs> the end is near. I actually left out two slides I shouldn't have. It talks about um, if it, it basically just an increase in life insurance and stuff in the industry would increase from one point trillion to nine billion, nine trillion or whatever. But I'll just I'll use it since we're Nathan and tell you this. Everybody's kind of heard this stat. You know, Social Security Administration pays out what do we know? One point nine, yeah, one point nine billion dollars a day, and life insurance pays out one point six, one point five billion dollars a day. Go to Capitol Hill and talk about this, okay? I mean, we, there's no better career that provides the financial backbone of the United States than the life insurance industry. And I stumbled into the business off the college campus into Bill Cochran's agency, and I didn't know Northwestern Mutual from Northwestern Airlines, you know what I mean? And so I got really lucky 20 years ago that I stumbled into this noble profession. And so it's been my pursuit to help advisors be able to more clearly help clients so that we can provide financial security because there is ignorance in the marketplace. There's ignorance on Capitol Hill. And if we don't do it, who does? But we have to have the courage. You have to prospect and get out there because life insurance is sold, not bought. People left on their own devices aren't out seeking this stuff out. You have to engage in courageous conversations to help align actions with intentions. Otherwise, name, rank, serial numbers, not gonna get it. And then finally, we have to simplify the process so we stop confusing people and so that we can do what we're there to do, which is help them take action and move forward. So with that, thank you for choosing this session. I hope this was valuable to you guys. See ya.